chaps, welcome along to the vlog. I've just uh, treated myself to a little bit of toasted sourdough, which uh, we've been making at home. Maybe one day I'll share a video with you, but I think there's thousands of videos out there with people doing sourdough bread at the minute. This one's particularly exciting though, because the sourdough starter came from a rhubarb farmhouse saison. So yeah, and it's, uh, it's quite a, uh, lively and excited sourdough starter. Anyway, that's for another video as I said. So today, this morning I've weighed out the hops for the next uh, week. So we have double dry hop schedules for all the beers that we made last week. The vacant gets two charges per 500 litres of beer of 750 grams of mosaic. One on day three, one on day five. So we've had to weigh out four containers full of hops for that. And then of course the proof of concept also gets two charges and each charge per 500 litres of beer consists of 600 grams of Amarillo, 600 grams of Mosaic and 600 grams of Simcoe, totaling 1800 grams per dry hop. And like I said, there's two of those. So that's a heck of a lot of hops going, not the most hops going into a beer that I've ever seen, but it's up there in terms of grams per litre, it's not bad at all. So that's weighed out, it's in the fridge, covered in cling film, that should be good until we need it, maybe Thursday, Friday. Update on the can seamer from Innovus Engineering. Another two weeks almost since my last contact with them and still nothing. I can understand that we are definitely going through the COVID-19 crisis and I'm sure that because these guys are fabricating big stainless steel machines they probably sourced quite a few components from China so I have a little bit of sympathy for them in that case but a little bit more communication would be nice so I'll be giving them another email this week saying what's going on because we want to get canning of course yesterday I spent a little bit of time putting together a label for the cans or at the very least modifying the bottle label so it's suitable to go onto cans put a little picture up here of it and uh, we're looking to probably do this in small print runs of uh, a thousand or so to keep costs uh, to keep wastage should I say down to a minimum um, of course we could print a lot more and save money but we just don't have that kind of capital at the minute so we'll do small print runs couple of pence more per label but I think we'll be able to swallow that up in the total retail price of the can and then in the future when we get better at it it can come down. I've also uh, managed to source a can labeler for a princely sum of around £350. It's called an MT50 and they're available on eBay. I've taken a risk we spent a little bit of the money that we got in the government grant to buy this. So I'm hoping I can make that money work for us to enable us to come out the other side of the COVID-19 crisis running a little bit faster than we would have been had we not uh, speculated with this cash and just used it to pay the bills. I think you guys probably share my enthusiasm in terms of wanting to see this business hit the ground running when it does finally uh, reopen. Uh, at full tilt. So when that uh, can label arrives there'll be a little bit of playing around and setting up with that as well to see if we can get it working but again I think it's going to be reliant on getting this seamer in house so we can at least seal some of those cans up because they need to be kind of uh, well firm and whole before you put them through the machine. So uh, a lot of waiting going on for things to arrive and uh, beer to ferment I guess. Uh, I need to finish off cleaning the boil kettle that's just sprung to mind so I'm going to do that first and get rid of the uh, caustic that's in there. I actually put hypochlorite in there which is dangerous for the stainless but because it was sat over the weekend I thought it was probably the best uh, best route to go. And then when we have finished that I've got a couple more of the shelves that I showed you on the other video, the brief update that I did. Pallet racking We've got some more of that to go up, maybe above the pilot kit. And then we'll come back and see well, what we're going to do next. Maybe that will take us to the end of the day. Maybe not. Who knows? 
Anyway, let's get cracking with the knacking like expect. Well, here we have it, folks. Excuse the din in the background. We'll still see IP in and the radio is on. But this here is the can applicator, the can label applicator, or bottle, or whatever. Uh, it's called the MT50 from an eBay seller and shipped by Yodel. And it arrived in really quite bad condition, but I didn't film the unpackaging. Um, before I plug it in, there's a couple of things right out of the box that aren't right, but uh, I kind of expected some of this to be uh, a bit dodgy. A couple of things that you can see, for instance, the finish on this stainless steel. Well, it looks like it's been hit by some 40 grit. <laughs> but, you know, never mind about that. That's fine. That's just aesthetics. Before I plugged it in, though, I was keen to check that the whole thing was earthed so I didn't get an electric shock and um, it's not essentially so I'm going to slip this front cover off we're going to have a look and see if we can put an earth cable in there just for peace of mind this section here is um, a little counter I believe that you adjust to uh, determine I think the length of the label or something like that but I've watched a video online it said don't fiddle with it what you need to do is adjust these little probes instead so we'll have a play with that later on he said move this back and forth and anyway I'll know more when I know more so I'm gonna dive right into this little beast and you can see that uh, it's got like a nailed roller on the bottom there all these guide rollers, that one's uh, not powered, that one's powered. That one must be squashed onto the powered roller. That one's not powered, that's an idle pulley. This one's powered by uh, either a belt or a chain in here. That one's idle as well. So you basically put your can on there, you set the depth, you drop the top roll down, and as that top roll comes down, it activates a little micro switch down here which actually without the can being on is quite badly set up if you watch this it pushes it down the side so we're gonna have to rejig that as well but thankfully I'm gonna be taking this front cover off anyway to have a look so uh, we'll pop back in a second when we can see what's going on on the inside so there we go, a nice little earth cable connected to the outlet there. So that should allow everybody to feel a little bit safer. I'll be able to sleep at night now. But there's no point in doing that unless I actually modify the cable that came with the device. So this here has a sleeved earth pin. So the reason we have a sleeve neutral or sleeved live pin is as you're pulling the pin out of the plug socket then you can't slip your fingers around the inside and electrocute yourself on a bare terminal but the trouble with a sleeved earth pin is that when you slide the plug into the socket the contacts are sat a little bit further forwards and they ride onto the plastic here effectively disconnecting the earth so there's no point me ap applying an earth to this machine if we're going to keep this plug on so I'm going to do what I advise everybody else to do when they see one of these sleeved earth pins and that's to chop it off and throw it in the bin 
And then I'm going to install a 13 amp fuse, which is CE marked from our friends at Tool Station. Yeah, so on second thoughts, fortunately I have another one of these uh, connectors, IEC connectors, IEC 13 or something. I can't remember what they're called. Anyway, I've got another one. It fits. <laughs> so because this is a, a um, pressed on fitting on the end here, I'm going to get rid of the whole cable because let's just have a look at this wire if we can focus down look how thin those strands are I won't even say this is 0.5mm square I'd much rather go along the terms of 0.1mm square now granted the machine's only rated for 50 watts but Jesus talk about skimping I mean how much would it have cost extra for a little bit of cable but it is made in China. I'm surprised it was shipped so quickly. It was only ordered two days ago, so they've obviously got drop shipping warehouse in the UK, but uh, well, the whole shebang, all of that, well, just ain't worth the risk. So I'm gonna go and get some uh, three core, 0.75 mil square, and we'll wire one of these up. So we'll come back when I've done that. Another 15 to 20 minutes, I don't really need to, uh, didn't anticipate on wasting. Anywho. Okay, I've done a little bit of fiddling about, and uh, we've got some stout labels on here that we're probably not gonna use. End of a roll. I've used about 30 already though, setting this up. And I think we've pretty much dialed it in. I can see there's a problem here. So I'm just gonna wind this back a little bit. So it doesn't interfere with that screw and then that should be out the way nicely can you see down that edge we just want that out the way like that so this section attached on here as you can see three bolts holds this uh, feed roller on the feed roller is tight and it's held tight with this spring loaded kind of gasket material as you can see i've earthed it and everything else I haven't fiddled with this little bit here. This is the laser contraption. So it's reading um, the output from a infrared LED. So one side is gonna be obviously an emitter and the other one is a receiver. So when there is some solid material such as this label in between the two sensors, then it's a low reading, like 430 odd. And then when it's the backing tape, which is this stuff here, it goes up to around 4,000 or something, or 1,000. So that effectively tells the machine that it's the end of the label and then the start of a new one, and it stops it automatically. So we've come over here, under this roller here, that then sets it up for going through the sensor. If you don't get it through the sensor so that each gap in between each label is picked up by this detector, for instance, if this section here is too far forwards and it's just plain paper, backing paper running through the sensor, then you'll have the same problem that I just had where it just runs and runs and runs and puts about eight labels on a bottle for you. Um, the bottle diameter and everything is set here so the bottle can sit on nicely. I've done a little bit of troubleshooting and it pays to just have a little bit of the label sticking out the top there. You set how long your labels are by moving this sensor backwards and forwards along this rail. So uh, if you run it and one label is halfway out, then you want to move the sensor back. If it's not out far enough, you want to move the sensor forwards a little bit. Okay. So we'll continue with our feed in this roll of uh, backing paper up through behind that roller in there up between the big powered roller and the blade down behind this roller this is the bottle guide roller nothing to do with the labels and then over the top of this roller this is to keep it off this metal section and then it goes in and down 
behind this powered roller and this powered roller is also coupled with this knurled roller here which has these screws at the bottom these thumb screws so you wind the thumb screws all the way down feed the paper through and then back underneath again you can have it just coming out here and that's end of story but you feed it back through there and then that comes through to this section here where you have this handy dandy little slidey thing which can grab the paper and this will roll the paper up for you at the end of the day so you're kind of not stuck with leftover paper everywhere floating around and then I imagine you just pull that off and bin it but that's what that bit's for anyway and that's um, I think that's on a belt because that one you can move this one look on its own whereas these rollers you can't move them so MT50 bottle filler from eBay 350 pounds delivered in two days from ordering on a Saturday delivered by Yodel smashed to pieces in the box but fortunately no damage you get a couple of Allen keys and a couple of spare bolts and a spare um, micro switch to go in here you adjust this micro switch here using this Allen screw or set screw if you like down there um, so that when you close the lid this top roller touches your bottle as well as activates the micro switch and that means that it squashes this um, other roller down on top of the bottle so the label is applied properly so here we go bottle on up to the stop that I've preset yeah lovely and we're just going to close the lid and there we go it did one cycle all on its own and there we have a pre-applied bottle label it'll work the same with cans it'll work the same with medicine bottles anything cylindrical it'll work the same so there we go put another one on top of it just like that how's that how do you like them apples and if you look at how accurate it is it's pretty darn close there's the start of the other label there's the other label we're probably out by I don't know two tenths of a mil something like that which is perfect for me it's way better than hand labeling and I'm really really pleased with it so now that that's complete uh, I'd say if you've got any questions just ask me in the comments below I'll try and answer them but uh, these days I'm struggling to see all the questions all the comments but anyway that's the MT50 that's geared up now for cans all I have to do is obviously just change change the position where the labels gonna go because the labels on the cans are a lot deeper a hell of a lot deeper right anyway that's that job done as you can hear I'm still CIPing <laughs> CIPing and uh, if I turn the radio down there we go we managed to get the sink back into the corner the pilot kits in this in this section here it's a little bit of a tight squeeze I could have done with another six inches but you know what I don't know a man who uh, would say no to that I'm gonna try and put this section up the top so we have two two shelves one right up at the top and then one shelf here and then I'm going to have some scaffolding boards to cut down to make some more shelving like this nice and strong ain't nothing coming down off of those bad boys so yeah I'm going to carry on doing that folks and uh, yeah see you in a bit Whew, I'm about to call it a day folks I had the CIP running all day on the boil kettle and it's my fault shouldn't have done it I left sodium hypochlorite in there over the weekend so that sodium hypochlorite is the most aggressive cleaner that we've got in the brewery and I used it one two three for these three tanks before I brewed I think I even cleaned the boil kettle with it as well beforehand so it had been in three tanks and then I put it back into the boil kettle to clean that and uh, 
carbon dioxide neutralizes sodium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide is another uh, huge part uh, huge ingredient to hypochlorite uh, hypochlorite so what I think's happened is because it sat in a tank which had had beer in it and it probably has some CO2 left in there as well it pretty much killed its cleaning power so by the time it made it back to the boil kettle to finish cleaning in there well it had run out of strength so uh, even though it's cleaned it hasn't removed all of the proteins that are stuck to the side of the kettle so what I've done is drained it down and put some brand new uh, Chloroquest, no, not Chloroquest, Cosgleam, Cosgleam Plus in there and I'm going to set the timer on the control panel and we're just going to let that roll, I'll just show you this here, it's all backwards because I'm on the front facing camera um, on the phone, on the mobile phone, my normal camera is sat here look and there's the nifty 50 that gave us those fantastic shots the other week. I don't often use that lens, but it's a good lens. Anyway, let's go on to program. And we're just gonna clear three o'clock that said there. Uh, so now we want to go to program two off. Well, the time now is uh, 4.45. So let's go for Uh, five, a bit longer than that. Six o'clock. Okay, and then we'll just press clock again. So, on, auto off now. So that'll turn off all on its own when we decide to go home, which, guess what, is now. So I've got some uh, bread to bake this evening. Woohoo! So I'm going to go on and do that, and we'll see you on tomorrow's vlog where we're going to. Uh, finished cleaning the boil kettle, dry hop at the beers that we made last week. We've got three tanks of beer there. I've weighed all the dry hops out in the fridge. I think I might, just before I go home, knock them up a couple of degrees for a diacetyl rest, which I can do in the summertime when it's nice and warm, and then um, lock up and go home. So I'll see you tomorrow, folks, on the next one. And uh, yeah, we'll come back in and do it all again. Cheers. I suppose it wouldn't be fair if I didn't uh, put an addendum on. That's this evening's bread, which is, um, let me think, 60% brown, no, 60% white, 40% brown. Here's my starter, which I've been going for a while now, since the 9th, and uh, Abigail's named it Rose, which is quite fitting, because it wants to rise, and it does. And then out here, We've got tomorrow's loaf, which again is uh, different to the last one. So this one we're going to go 400 grams of white, 100 grams of brown, 70% hydration, 75 grams of starter, uh, which is 15%. Uh, I've gone for lower salt. This is low salt as well, so the sodium content's even less. This is 8 grams of salt, so it's just over 1.5%. Uh, so there we go, yeah, 500 gram loaf, 500 grams of flour, and uh, 350 grams of water, giving us a 70% hydration. Anyway, this is doing an auto lease at the minute. In about an hour's time, I'll add the salt and the starter. Give it a quick mix, and then I'll stick it in that tub there for the night. And we'll stretch it a few times, and then tomorrow morning we'll shape it and pop it back in the banneton. Ready for baking tomorrow evening. It's as simple as that. So I was hoping to sit in the sunshine a little bit, but we're just having a little bit of a stormy poo. You might be able to make out some of the thunder, or if we're lucky, we'll catch a flash of lightning. But I doubt it, you know what it's like. Mother Nature's camera shy.
Oh, I saw a flash, but it wasn't on the shot. Anyway, I just thought I'd share it with you. Abby and Gemma have come out with Reggie to enjoy the giant raindrops. Because it's still pretty warm. It's a balmy summer storm.